my name is Jill Bray Bowen, CEO of Northwestern Medical Center, and your host of the NMC Health Beat Show, dedicated to discussing important healthcare topics of interest to our community. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Michael Barnum. He's a surgeon with Northwestern Orthopedics, and today we're going to be talking about a specific type of issue related to the sacroiliac joint. Ooh, <laughs> that sounds exciting. So thank you for uh, coming on the show to talk with us. I think this is going to be a very interesting uh, topic uh, for our community. So. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I think you're new to the show, so maybe tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background. Um, my name is Michael Barnum. I am an orthopedic spine surgeon in Northwestern Orthopedics. I have been in practice here for about nine years. I was in practice for eight years down in Virginia Beach, Norfolk area, prior to that. I did my training at Johns Hopkins. I was uh, studied biomedical engineering, so I have a uh, interest in actual structural stability, if you want to talk mm. it, we'll get it that way. I went to Hahnemann University for medical school and then I was uh, trained at Brown University for seven years in uh, orthopedic trauma and orthopedic spine surgery. And then you moved to St. What brought you to St. Albans? Uh, new wife, new life. <laughs> That's fantastic. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, we're grateful to have you here in this community for sure. So the sacroiliac joint. So what is it and what does it do for us? Well, SI joint problems have been kind of a thorn in, in the side of uh, spine surgeons for many years. We do these big operations on people. We fix their leg pain, we get rid of their back pain, and then they, they say, oh, I'm doing great, except could you just get rid of this pain that's right here in my back? Huh. Um, it is, <clears throat> it's a problem more with the pelvis. And if you look historically at things, um, about 20% of people that come in for back pain um, for a usual visit in their primary care physician's office or in an orthopedic office, <clears throat> excuse me, um, actually have SI joint problems. And they often are missed because people are not looking for them. They're not educated in it, they're not trained in it. Uh, they're not trained to look for it. Mm -hmm. And the mind or the eye only sees what the mind knows so to say. Okay. So if you're not, if you don't know about it, you're not going to see it, you're not going to diagnose it, or you're going to misdiagnose it because it is very similar to problems that you may have with disc herniations or sciatica or uh, pinched nerve in your back. Um, so it's, it's actually a fairly common thing that is very often missed. So what do you, I guess, what are the first um, signs for someone that's, that's having a problem, is it? People come in with SI joint problems and they basically have just back pain. And it's really more buttock pain. Okay. Um, low back pain. Not typically in your, in your lower back, but right in your buttock. And it's a very simple, I mean, Oh, good. You've I got like, a little uh, I like picture little, here. I like my does. little diagram. Okay. The, the pelvis is made of three bones. One, two, and three. And they're connected here in the front. That's right down in, in front of your pelvis. And here in the back. Okay. okay. When this joint gets inflamed, it gets, it, it gets irritated from one reason or another. And multiple reasons. In this part of the country, uh, probably a third of my patients are from a, uh, an injury, a slip and a fall okay. on the ice, uh, a lot of ATVs going into trees, those types of things. Really? Wow. You can see it in postpartum patients as well okay. after childbirth and actually in patients that have also had already had surgery on their, on their spine. So the joint gets inflamed, it creates pain just like this very similar to a herniated disc okay. or sciatica. <clears throat> um, 
It often hurts when they roll over in bed, getting in and out of a car, um, in and out of a chair, when they bear weight on that leg, as opposed to a disc herniation where it's more of a shooting pain down the leg. Um, <clears throat> So that's, I mean, that's essentially the, the, the uh, physiology, if you want to call it, behind the problem. So how do you, when you look at this, isolate that as the problem versus something else? Because it sounds like it is a lock like back pain. And so how do you isolate that? There's an entire algorithm on how, to, on how to diagnose this. And that's the hardest part is diagnosing it. I've been doing surgeries on the SI joint since 2009. I was probably one of the first five or six surgeons in the country trained on it. Mm -hmm. And I've actually been teaching how to diagnose and how to do the procedure since 2010. Wow. Um, one of the reasons that it uh, has been brought to light recently is because Blue Cross, and I'll have to thank the, the chief medical officers at Blue Cross for this, um, is that they in 2015 decided all of a sudden it was an experimental procedure. But I've worked with two different chief medical officers at Blue Cross of Vermont mm -hmm. over the last several years, and now they now recognize it as a viable procedure. So they are covering it now where they were not covering it before. Wow. <laughs> so from a patient's perspective, what is the procedure like? What, what does it entail and what can they expect before and after. What it is, it's a, what I used to tell patients when I was in Virginia was that the good news is it's not your spine. Mm -hmm. Bad news is it's your pelvis. Mm. The good news is you're not going to die with it because eventually <laughs> it will burn out. The bad news is it takes a long time to get better. Mm. And the other good news is you'll never need an operation for it. Oh. Because the surgeries that we had prior to this were very large operations. I mean, we would have to make big incisions, do a big bone grafting procedure to the, to the SI joint. Patients would be on crutches for three months. Wow. It'd be about a six month recovery time. I mean, it was a huge operation. Wow. Okay, a long slide for a short run. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. right? Whereas now we have a procedure that's minimally invasive, it's most people do it through one incision. I do a two incision approach, but it's uh, two, two incisions about that long. Um, we put screws across the SI joint to stabilize it. And then we drill into the SI joint and pack bone graft in there. It's basically um, takes about 45 minutes. You're in the hospital just overnight. You're on crutches for about three weeks and that's it. Wow. There's, there's it, nothing after that. What about therapy or? We usually don't need therapy afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, we do therapy beforehand. The biggest problem with diagnosing this is that there's no diagnostic study that can tell you that it is or is not your SI joint. So what you have to do is you have to rule everything out first. You have to have an MRI of your, of your lumbar spine to make sure there's nothing going on in your lumbar spine. Okay. Um, the only way, the gold standard for diagnosing it is an injection. And you do a diagnostic injection where you inject the SI joint with Novocaine, just mm -hmm. like if the dentist was to numb up a, mm -hmm. a tooth that hurt, if they numb up that tooth, mm -hmm. pain goes away, then you know it's that tooth. Wow. Is that right. done in your office, the injection, or that's where done, do you do it? That's done in the office, In the office? Yes. Okay. And we know right then and there within the first five to ten minutes whether the pain is coming from that joint or not. We usually, we also put um, cortisone into the SI joint to try and settle the, everything down, and that often works as well. Wow. Um, so, I mean, it's a very small procedure. Mm-hmm but it is very difficult to diagnose and you really do have to look for it. You have to be looking for it to, um, to make the diagnosis. So when you, if you're, you're talking to the community and so what do you recommend? So if people are having back pain or they feel that they've um, had it for a long time, well, how do, what do you recommend for folks to do 
um, if they're having back pain. In general? <laughs> I guess in general, because it sounds like <coughs> you're not really sure that that's what this is, and so if someone's been living with back pain, you know, what's their, what's their first step? What do you, what do you recommend well, Usually that? what happens is people have been living with back pain for years. Mm -hmm. They have a problem, they see somebody, they tell them, all right, their MRI is negative, there's nothing wrong, they just, they just have this back pain, they just have to live with it. And it's basically they're just, they're, they go undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of coming in, being evaluated, and getting the correct diagnosis. And then taking those patients through physical therapy, using, um, we use a, an SI joint belt, which is a, a belt that holds the pelvis together to try and decrease their symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, we try injections, we do chiropractics, we do everything we can before we do surgery. Right. I mean, that obviously is the last resort. Sure, sure. Now, after folks have surgery, are they pain free? I know it's My, kind of hard to say 100%, but generally, what's the results? Generally, it's, it, they're amazed at the results. I mean, I, have a, I would say I have about a 90% success rate with the surgery. And what does success mean? Pain-free or mobility or? My goal with surgery, whether it be on the spine or the SI joint, <clears throat> is to bring somebody from a level of dysfunctional pain to a level of functional pain. Okay. Okay. And dysfunctional pain meaning they can't do the things that they want to do every day. They can't go out for walks. They can't go hiking. They can't ride a bike. They can't work. They have narcotic dependent pain. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the goal is to get them back to having just what normal people have for back pain. I mean, I wake up with back pain every day. Mm -hmm. But I can walk six miles with my wife and go skiing if I want to and go to work every day. <laughs> sure, sure. So it's really understanding where the person wants to be right. with their function and then right. can you actually help them get back to that level of, of function. Exactly. Which still could be with pain, but they're able with to function. With normal functional pain. Functional yes. pain. Ah. So what are the things that we've, we've talked about this, is there anything else though that the community should know about this type of pain, this procedure, that you think is important for them to know that I might not have asked you, but it's, it's important. I think what's important to know about this is that it is, like I said, the most important thing is that it's often missed. Okay. It's a misdiagnosis. And there are a lot of patients out there that have previously had surgery on their spine mm -hmm. that are still in pain. And they're basic, basically were misdiagnosed originally had an operation, still have the same pain that they had before, and just didn't have their problem addressed mm -hmm. because it was, it was missed. So if someone is listening to this and they're saying, I still have pain and I'm not able to function the way I would like, they've been living with it for a long time, it's worth coming back to see you to, or not coming back, but seeing you even for a first time to say, Let's take a look at this? Correct. Okay. I mean, I've had patients come, I've seen patients that have come to see me from Maine, from North Carolina, um, from Canada. I mean, I have a very large area of patients that, that come in to see me for this mm -hmm. specific problem. And with that success rate that, uh, that you cited, um, that's, that's pretty amazing difference in people's lives. It is. So what are the things do you do, you do for um, besides the sacroiliac joint? Um, I basically do any type of spine surgery, cervical surgery, lumbar surgery. Um, we do things here at Northwestern that are not done at bigger centers in the area, um, like flexible rod stabilization of the spine where you're actually putting screws in and you're putting rods in that still move wow. and stabilize the spine, but mm -hmm. still do that. Um, artificial disc surgery for the cervical spine. Mm -hmm. um, 
the SI joints until probably until about a year ago. I think I was the only one in the state doing these. There are two other surgeons now that are doing them, um, but they do them on a limited basis. Mm -hmm. um, inner spinous stabilization, which is more of a minimally invasive type of procedure. Um, what's your most, uh, what's the most frequent thing that you, that you see in your practice? I mean, the most common surgery that I do is, it would be a lumbar fusion. And which, that, is a, which is a big surgery. And is that usually a result of a, a, an injury, a back injury? or? It's usually from what we call as lumbar stenosis, where patients mm -hmm. have leg pain, mm -hmm. they have back pain, they have instability of their spine where the bones are sliding back and forth mm -hmm. on each other. And, and what role does um, physical therapy play in, in with most of your patients? I, I mean, because when when you actually do these type of repairs, <coughs> there must be something that you need to recommend the patients so they, they get to their maximum uh, mobility. So Physical therapy has a huge part, a huge role in it. And it's, I wouldn't say mandatory, but it's practically mandatory in my practice that people go through physical therapy even prior to surgery. Mm -hmm. even, if they're, even if I know they're going to need surgery that they have, that they go through physical therapy, they maximize their conditioning mm -hmm. so that even if they can recover faster from surgery. And then very often we do need to place patients into physical therapy afterwards, starting with aquatic therapy mm -hmm. and then advancing that to getting them back to their usual activities. Because when someone has that much pain, they're usually not as mobile as uh, they'd like to be or, or they can be. And so you may, quote, fix them, but that's part of it. In order, they have to, for full recovery, um, they have to do things themselves. They, there is some uh, responsibility on the patient for There's the success of the surgery. Huge responsibility on yeah. the patient. Yeah, so it's, okay. you can only do so much, I bet. Exactly. Yeah. We have, patients have to take an active role in their own health care. Yeah. Yeah, so that physical therapy hopefully will get them back on a regime where they can stay active Correct. and maximize um, the work that you've done uh, exactly. with, their, um, with their procedure. So, Are there any other recommendations for back health? I mean, how do people prevent even getting to you? There's all kinds of literature out there as to what people should and should not do. They say, should I, should I do this type of activity or not do this type of activity? But the reality is when it comes to back pain, the best things that you can do for back pain are aerobic activities. Okay. And if you think about it, it's, it's aerobic activities, it's stopping smoking. Really? Yes. Okay. And if you think about them, they go hand in hand because Aerobic activity is going to increase the blood flow to the spine. It's going to increase the mm -hmm. oxygen that the spine sees. Smoking does the exact opposite, opposite. of yeah. that. Those are the two things that are well documented in the literature that improve back pain. Wow. Essentially everything else is just a band-aid. So moving and stopping smoking. Yep. Wow. And I'm glad you stated that. I'm glad we talked about this because I don't think that would naturally be something that people think about. I'm in pain, so I should move less. Right. And smoking is not a, a natural uh, connection. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other words of wisdom before we wrap up our time today? With regards to activity and you want to look at wellness across the state of Vermont, one of the things that um, you and I probably did was what did we do physical ed <laughs> physical education we did in school PE in school what's okay. happened to that what's happened to it is that as of right now in the state of Vermont <clears throat> the high school students are required to do three semesters of PE to graduate mm-hmm Whereas we did it every year, and when you look at 
students in this in the state sometimes the only activity they have is the the PE that that they that they have mm -hmm. to go that they have to do in school especially these days with cell phones and internet and everything else nobody's getting out and nobody's doing anything active yeah. okay they're sitting mm -hmm. on their phones they're sitting on computers mm -hmm. and i would say I think the state should make it mandatory that students go back to doing eight semesters of of PE to graduate. Yeah. I, I I totally agree. I mean, we're um, even with the work with Rise Vermont and trying to get into the schools and and getting active uh, play into the curriculum to get get moving because you can can work do um, you know you can learn about different things and be moving while you're doing it. So you're right, sedentary environment, uh, that's the lifestyle change has really um, you know, added so much to this. And we are actually going to be kicking off an active play campaign for Franklin and Grand Isle. We hope mm -hmm. to take it statewide, but we're going to start here to try to get people moving yes. again. We wow. Def definitely need to. Wow, so you would write a prescription for, for active play? Ab absolutely. <laughs> It's like the NFL. <laughs> that's right. The NFL plays 60. Yes, yeah, that's exactly right. 60 minutes a day, do something. That's fantastic. It's so funny that <clears throat> whatever we talk about um, on the show to, to deal with health, it, it comes back to our own behaviors. Absolutely. How well we eat, how well we're moving, how well we're sleeping. It, it comes back to all of that. And here we are starting off with sacroiliac joint and we're now we're talking about move exactly. get moving exactly yeah. get moving so that's get fantastic. moving and keep moving yes i mean i really worry about when you even with the kids going to school and they may be on a sports team but then they go to college and maybe they don't play on a sports team so what keeps people moving after Where do you think school the, fre the freshman 15 come from yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They all put on that 10, 15 pounds. Yes. Right when they go to college. Right, right. Well, Dr. Barnum, it's been really wonderful to have you here on the show. And I'm sure the audience is, uh, the community is going to really enjoy listening to this because there's a lot of people living with pain. And mm -hmm. I think you've given them some really good insight to not give up hope, come in and see you. Um, yep. There may be something else going on. Um, so that's terrific. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm Jill Barry Bowen, CEO of Northwestern Medical Center and your host of the Health Beat Show. We've learned a lot today about pain, but most importantly, we've learned how important it is to keep moving or get moving and to stop smoking. Thank you for joining us. <music>